So if you're here as a member of the public, we ask that you wait to talk or uh, interact with us until the end of uh, the meeting at 345. We'll have a public comment section. And then, of course, you can always be in touch with um, ANR as the admin support for this anytime. OK, so that's the business thing out of the way, the business part for, for a minute anyway. Um, so what I'd like to do is, I know you're eating. Normally, I'd have us maybe take three deep breaths, but that seems a little dangerous. So don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but what we, we are going to do is read a poem together because there's nothing like art to make you feel a little more grounded. Um, and I'd love to have us uh, have four volunteers to read the poem, including our friends on Teams. You can volunteer to read part of the poem. We're all set up to do that if you want. So I need four volunteers to read a wonderful poem called A Map to the Next World by Joy Harjo. Okay, we've got one over here. Laura's going to come to you. Just keep your hand up and she'll give you a copy of it. Anybody online want to do it? Oh, somebody's raising their hand. And Stephanie, I have to mention, Stephanie's been awesome. She's here to support our team's people. Um, so if you need anything, she's, she's there in the chat with you. Um, and then she put the poem in the chat. I can't see who's um, if you volunteer to read a stanza of the poem, if you could turn on your camera, um, if you aren't, if you already are, I just can't tell. <laughs> okay, do we have four people, four readers, three in the room and one on Teams? We need one more volunteer. Oh, Rich, please, yes. Here comes Laura. Great, so we'll start, we'll start here. And all you're going to do is read. You read seven lines. It's just math. Joy didn't do this. I broke it up. Um, so you read down to a line, and then and then you'll read down to a line. And who's on team's going to do it? Susanna. Susanna. Susanna, you get to end us. You get to take us out with a bang. So you'll be number four, OK? OK, so we'll start here. And you can say your name if you want. Hi, I'm Dave Pelletier um, with the Agency of Transportation. Uh, a Map to the Next World by Joy Harjo. In the last days of the fourth world, I wish to make a map for those who would climb through the hole in the sky. My only tools were the desires of humans as they emerged from the killing fields, from the bedrooms and the kitchens. For the soul is a wanderer with many hands and feet. The map must be of sand and can't be read by ordinary light. It must carry fire to the next tribal town for renewal of spirit. In the legend are instructions of the language of the land, how it was we forgot to acknowledge the gift as if we were not in it or of it. Take note of the proliferation of supermarkets and malls, the altars of money. They best describe the detour from grace. Keep track of the errors of our forgetfulness. The fog steals our children while we sleep. Flowers of rage spring up in the depression. Monsters are born there of nuclear anger. Should we read the next stanza? Rich Halship, Vermont Commission, Native American Affairs, Delno Beneke. Trees of ashes wave goodbye to goodbye, and the map appears to disappear. We no longer know the names of the birds here how to speak to them by their personal names. Once we knew everything in this lush promise. What I'm telling you is real. It is printed in a warning on the map. Our forgetfulness stalks us. It walks the earth behind us, leaving a trail of paper diapers, needles, wasted blood. An imperfect map will have to do, little one. Place of entry is the sea of your mother's blood. Your father's small death as he longs to know himself in another. There is no exit. The map can be interpreted through the wall of the intestine, a spiral on the road to knowledge. Adela, um, from the Agency of Natural Resources. You will travel through the membrane of death, smell cooking from the encampment where our relatives make a feast of fresh, Deer meat and corn soup in the Milky Way. They have never left us. We abandoned them for science. And when you take your next breath, 
as we enter the fifth world, there will be no X, no guidebook with words you can carry. You will have to navigate by your mother's voice. Renew the song she is singing. Fresh courage glimmers from planets and the lights and lights the map printed with the blood of history. A map you will have to know by your intention, by the language of songs. When you emerge, know the tracks of the monsters layers where they entered the cities of artificial light and killed what was killing us. You will see red cliffs. They are the heart, contain the ladder. A white deer will greet you when the last human climbs from the destruction. Remember the hole of shame marking the act of abandoning our tribal grounds. We were never perfect. Yet the journey we make together is perfect on this earth who was once a star and made the same mistakes as humans. We might make them again, she said. Crucial to finding the way is this. There is no beginning or end. You must make your own map. Thank you to our readers. Now we can take our deep breaths, maybe. So, uh, today, uh, I, I also want to do a, a brief land acknowledgement uh, to open us up as well. I want to recognize that we gathered here today on the current and unceded home of the West Artabeneke people. These lands and waters have been a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people for thousands of years. We understand that the state of Vermont and the United States as we know them were founded in a more than 500 year process of violent colonization and land theft. It is crucial to acknowledge the history of the place we work and recognize that our long term work of climate and environmental justice is inextricably connected to justice for indigenous people. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Senator Rom Hinsdale, who's here to give us a little context and history for why we're here today. As you can tell already, this is not going to be a typical state meeting, I hope. And uh, I'm really excited to do this work with you. And really, thank you so much for being here to yeah. set the context. For thank you. Well, I want to thank Jessica and Carla and others for for inviting me. It's really a privilege to be here. Um, I'm just feeling a lot of gratitude because as Caitlin knows, because we graduated from the Rubenstein School the same year, I started this work 17 years ago. <laughs> um, and I stand on the shoulders of a great many people who either didn't have the language to call this environmental justice or just felt really isolated or alone in trying to um, address what we know as environmental injustice in Vermont. Um, in so many contexts that you'll talk about over the course of today. Um, but it has been a privilege to do this work over 17 years. Um, it's what <clears throat> got me to the legislature. In fact, my senior thesis was writing an environmental justice bill that was introduced in 2007 in the legislature. <laughs> um, so just so people know, that's, you know, at the time I thought, what could be so harmful about an advisory council and collecting this data? <laughs> you know, that should be sort of square one. And here we are literally 17 years later, um, finally doing that work. So certainly that dates me as well. <laughs> um, but it's, I think in that time frame, um, what's really valuable is that, you know, I think the data collection really needs to come and that's in every facet of state government, but the ripening of having a network that Brittany's helping to lead and um, the data collection that Susanna is doing, it really has meant that when we do start this work, um, we're on a really solid foundation. And there's a coalition built outside of this particular set of groups um, that can help hold you accountable. And that's really critical as well, that when we look at other states, they don't just have an environmental justice advisory council. And by the way, about 40 or more other states have environmental justice framework built into their law. So this is not a place where Vermont has led. Um, you know, we're very behind. And in fact, you know, I started to have to say we're going to be out of civil rights compliance, the federal government, the EPA, everyone was telling us you have to have this. So, you know, we sort of also bear that mark of 
in some ways being forced to do this, <laughs> frankly. Um, but now I look around and I see, you know, Carla and um, new staff and people ready to do this work. And it is really meaningful. It shouldn't just be because we've been told we'll lose federal funding. Um, it is really critical work to do because it has value and because we have very isolated pockets of populations that have been fighting for environmental justice for a long time. The one that comes to mind for me that folks may or may not know about, um, you know, when I started my work and my thesis and research, the only formal environmental justice grant that had been received in the state of Vermont was for mobile home parks, um, mostly in Rutland County and Southern Vermont. Um, and maybe 10 or more mobile home parks were uh, highlighting that they had sewage backup and didn't have clean drinking water um, and received our one of our only major <laughs> environmental justice grants, in fact, in the state. So, you know, this work certainly predates me um, and it goes really far back. And I think, you know, that's probably what I'd like to spend just my brief remarks talking about. It's hard to try and hold the, the deep history of all of this, um, but I think you you will get into talking about these findings that show these huge disparities. And I just hope it doesn't lead people to think that people of color somehow brought this on themselves or low income people somehow brought this on themselves. Um, I try to say the hard things so other people of color don't have to, but Vermont doesn't look the way it does by accident. And that's a good and bad thing, right? We've had land use planning laws that have, and we ban billboards and things that I think a lot of us agree, you know, have protected the natural environment, which we can't forget has its own identity and should have its own voice in this space. Um, but, you know, from the time of, uh, of European settlement and colonization, that was the, that involved genocide and it continued into you know more recent recorded history with the eugenics movement and true indigenous erasure which is one of our original sins in this country um and although we like to celebrate that we you know didn't have um black enslavement in a major way in this state and that we abolished it in our in our founding constitution um you know there's been a lot of running black people out of this state that has taken place and making them feel unwelcome here, even if it wasn't written into the law. Um, if you haven't, I encourage you to look at documents during the time of the Great Migration, when a lot of Black people were moving north and not just trying to live in Chicago and you know major industrial cities, but trying to get their own piece of land and their own open space. Again, they were farmers, they had deep knowledge, and Vermont actually went out of its way to try and encourage Swedish farmers to come be in Vermont um, to avoid having to give any land to black farm farmers. Um, so when you look at the fact that we have such a minuscule amount of um, black land ownership and you know uh, black home ownership, unfortunately, that's really not by accident in Vermont. Um, and I think you know if people can start to wrestle with the discomfort of that, you can really listen better and you can make sure that you're centering the voices that need to be centered most in this process. I know that there are people here who work in state government and it's hard to hear like you have failed at your job or you know you haven't done enough. Um, but if you can get past feelings of defensiveness and just listen to what people are experiencing, there's real expertise and wisdom and deep knowledge from around the state and around the room um, from people who haven't had an opportunity to be part of these conversations. But our, you know, when we did, when Jennifer and I and Rejoice, who, you know, put together a lot of these findings, put this work together, we traveled around the state before the pandemic, and then we did a lot of online forums. We compensated people, and we told them, you're experts. You know what blighted properties you walk by every day. You know where your kids get to play or don't play. You know where you feel safe or you don't feel safe. You know, you know, if you're feeling like the air around you or, you know, your natural environment is killing you. Um, you're an expert and we want to hear that. And so many people felt like, you know, the $20 got me in the door, but hearing that I have expertise, that's that's a value, um, you know, is, is something I've never heard before. It's something that's really meaningful. And, you know, that really informed the bill. Um, I think it's great you have the findings up because, you know, that was a lot of the work that others who can't be here or didn't, you know, aren't lawmakers, helped put into the bill, as well as the definitions that you'll probably go over. Um, you know, the definitions 
were a labor of love where we looked at, frankly, the, we had gratitude to other states that had a lot of um, iterations of their environmental justice definitions, had been through lawsuits, had started to infuse climate justice into their definitions. Really grateful that Massachusetts had defined environmental costs and benefits because that's such a, it's a much easier way to look at the distribution um, of, you know, what we value or what we don't want to avoid and push into another community that defines environmental justice a lot better. Um, and so, you know, as Jennifer can tell you, at some point people like kept wanting to talk about it and wrestle with it and get more data. And I was like, I'm going to write a bill and y'all can help me if you want, you know, but it really felt like at some point we had to call it to question and make a beginning. Um, and I invite you all to do that too. This work is not done. Um, you should certainly move at the pace of trust and center the people who have been most marginalized and whose sense of urgency has not been prioritized. But, you know, from the 70s, Sierra Club, other major environmental organizations, when faced with the urgent plight of the urban poor and people of color and the rural poor, you know, basically said, that's not our fight um, and took votes, you know, that said, that's not what we're going to be working on. So the sense of urgency has been there. It's been there for a long time. It just hasn't been centered on those most uh, impacted by environmental destruction, and environmental decision making. Um, so, you know, I, I think the last thing that I'll say, and I'm happy to answer a question if there is one or anything like that, but um, is, you know, now as the chair of, Sen you know, Senate Economic Development and Housing, and uh, people have heard me say this, um, people of color don't come to the environmental movement, you know, as just black and brown faces saying the same things that white environmentalists are saying. Um, it's a completely different canon. It's a completely different relationship with the land. It's a really critical one. And just because someone's uncomfortable identifying as an environmentalist doesn't mean they don't have a deep connection to the land, don't consider themselves stewards of the land or caretakers of the land, um, but have been denied so many opportunities and have had the goalposts moved on them so many times with housing and transportation and quality of life that, you know, we we can't afford to say, you know, let's say our carrying capacity is done and we're closing our borders in Vermont. Um, you know, we're going to be a place of climate refugees. We're already a place of climate immigrants. And the climate immigrants are the ones who just don't like the rising heat in D.C., don't, you know, don't like the political climate, let's say, in you know, the southern part of the country, and they can buy a second home here, they can wait out, you know, whatever comes, they're going to be better off in the coming climate crisis. And when we think about what a just transition looks like, and then at some point, if we all believe, you know, what we think is, is possible with climate change, major cities will start to go underwater, places will become un uninhabitable. And as I say, like at every, the end of every zombie movie, Vermont will be a choice that, you know, is still appealing to people. Um, and so we're going to have to do a lot of work in advance to think about how we have the infrastructure and the cultural readiness um, to prepare for climate refugees um, and not have had climate immigrants come and pull the ladder up behind them and say, we're keeping our open space. We're keeping, you know, our our beautiful community and we're shutting other people out and we're doing it in the name of land use planning and, you know, um, and carrying capacity and a lot of words in, in the environmental canon that are weaponized against low income people and people of color. Um, so that's what I feel really strongly about in my work. Um, I'm just so grateful that you all are willing to do this. Definitely the, there are people who come to this where the stipend isn't enough and you don't get paid from your workplace to do this. And you know, you're coming and leaving kids behind and can't afford childcare or, you know, um, just sacrificing a lot to be here. And so if you're not one of those people, really try and listen as hard as you can to the people who are here with gratitude. If they say something really difficult, it's because they trust you to hear it. Um, and that's really important as we work, as we move this work forward, uh, because, you know, we, I will just say, we tried to make a bill that had enough room for people to grapple with what's a good index, what's a good way to measure environmental health and environmental justice. Um, you know, but there are a lot of people counting on you to make sure that at the end of this year or more, we have a mapping tool, we have a way to really capture 
um, the information we need to really redistribute our environmental costs and benefits and hopefully reduce those environmental costs for everybody. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And I'm gonna stay and listen to introductions just because I'm excited you're all here um, and then I'll, I'll slip out, but I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Well, with that, we are going to do some introductions. We're going to get to know each other a little bit. Uh, we've heard a couple of names, but there's lots of names in this room, probably new faces and some familiar ones for people. Um, and those on team, you're part of us today. We're going to do our very best to make this really feel like you're part of the love in the room. <laughs> um, so you you get about five-ish more minutes to kind of finish up eating. Um, and then the folks in the room, you have on the tables before you um, some pictures and there's all different kinds of images and you can do some image trading here as well. I think that's okay. Um, and what I want you to do in the room, and I'll get to you guys in a sec on Teams. In the room, I'd like you to choose an image that tells us something about yourself that you're willing to share. So you're going to introduce yourself, uh, your name and your pronouns and your title and which committee or advisory council you're on and, and then the image and kind of give us a sense of who you are a little bit as a person. Um, folks on teams, you don't have images in front of you, but you're in places, you're in a physical space. And I invite you to look around that space, see if there's an object, a picture, something that gives us a little sense of who you are, it could be what you're wearing, something that you have control over in your physical space that says, this is a little bit of who I am as a person, something you're willing to share. So we have about five minutes of you can chit chat, look at the pictures, and then we'll we'll do some introductions. Maybe last second. Trying to if I if this was the last image on Earth, like how what. What would I say? And I'm really getting stuck in the fact that I am not disorganized and have no Raise your hand if you're satisfied with the images before you and do some trading around. Well, I'm not. You should be great. I grew up looking at my grandmother's like people I Yeah, yeah, that's to be before May 10th. <laughs> Hey, have we made our image selection? Yes. And folks on teams, have you found something you're really to share with us? Let's try and get back on camera. Um, so folks in the room, is everyone done eating it? Almost? If you're done eating or as you finish up eating, I'd like to invite us to actually come sit in the chairs here and come a little closer with each other, uh, folks in the room. 
There's a piece of paper uh, there on the chair. You can just hold it. You'll need it in a moment. But um, oh, we'll use it take you. your no, take no, your no, photo no, and come sit paper, um, sit in this little horseshoe if you're willing. Okay. You can bring if you get something you're still eating. That's okay. You're not going to be bored in this meeting. You're going to move around a lot. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> Make sure you bring your picture. I I want them to be Sorry, so if you are on either the interagency committee or the advisory council, please join us on this little horseshoe. Not to exclude those who are <laughs> and folks on, folks on teams, if you are either a member of the interagency committee or the advisory council, if you could just raise your hand, we're going to do our best to make this back and forth between the room and team. Um, and I'll and Stephanie's going to help me make sure to to, to call on folks. Um, so just can everybody see the raise hand function? Okay. I love these hybrid setups. It's so easy. <laughs> um, I think it's awesome, but it, I don't I don't want I really feel for the people I've been there, right? Like you want to make everyone feel like they're part of it, right? Um, OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of we're going to do two people in the room and then a person on teams. OK, so we'll start over here so the camera can. Well, no, we'll start here because the camera's faced this way, if that's OK. Um, so you can say your name. Your pronouns, uh, if you're part of the interagency or the advisory council, and then share your image with us. Sure. Uh, my name is Dave Pelletier. I work with the Agency of Transportation. I use he, him pronouns. I should mention I'm here on behalf of Michelle Boomhauer. <coughs> we'll more regularly be representing um, the agency on uh, the interagency committee. And <clears throat> I have a picture. Um, it's going to be probably impossible to see on the screen, but I just have a picture of or an image of people playing in the snow by way of skiing or riding snowboards or and um, it's a, a personal point of connection for me and my family that we just enjoy doing things like that in the snow in the winter and it keeps us from going crazy in the dark and the cold <laughs> and, hot, and we connect on that level uh, the out outdoor physical activity. Thanks. Thank you. Dave. Dave, not David. Dave. Yes, Dave. Uh, either way is fine. Okay, yes. all right. Thank you. Yeah, thank yes. you. Uh, uh, my name is Mavi Kalma from uh, uh, the Agency of Education. And uh, I'm also like a uh, NIFSA coordinator from the uh, Agency of Education. Mm -hmm. So uh, the picture I have here is actually, I guess, it's uh, the water system. Uh, when I look at the picture, what well, is this? Uh, it has looked clear to me. So it's like having some issues this week. Uh, <laughs> we have clean water. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. It spoke to you. You yeah. wanted to clean it up. So you're saying you're a very clean person. Excellent. Well, <laughs> you come to my house. Um, is somebody willing on teams to go from either the advisory council or the interagency committee? I'm happy to go. Oh, oh, June, thank you. Yep. I'm not entirely sure what the protocol is. Uh, the designee for the department for the interagency committee is Claire McKelvany, who's in the room with you. Uh, I am the committee, the, the commissioner of the Department of Public Service, and Claire belongs to um, our agency. I'm here today to signal my support, my thorough and unwavering commitment to the work that this uh, group is doing. Uh, but Claire will be our point person. So if that fits in the program, great. And if not, feel free to disregard me any further in the meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I have with me, I hope you can see it in the room. Yeah. That is the yeah. Bluebird of Happiness. I keep the Bluebird of Happiness on my desk, um, whether in Montpelier or here at home, because um, 
fundamentally, I'm a happy person and I adore bluebirds. I spend a lot of time looking for them on my walks, but I find it is um, both necessary and helpful in this world to have an external manifestation of the state of heart that I aspire to. Um, I think someday we'll have a world where that's not necessary, at least in my life, that's what I will be pursuing. But that's why I have my little friend here. And that's all you really need to know about me. <laughs> um, so we'll go back to the room and we'll go to you and the next person. Uh, so Pete Gill, uh, Executive Director of the Natural Resources Board. Um, I'm here with the, I guess, the interagency um, and uh, with Sabina Haskell as our, the chair of the board. Um, and I brought or I picked uh, this picture of potatoes. Um, I'm not from Idaho, <laughs> um, but I did take a honeymoon to um, Peru and uh, and I just love the diversity of potatoes. And then that seemed very fitting for what we're talking about today, too. Hi, I'm Landis Marinello, General Counsel at the Public Utility Commission. And here for the interagency committee, I chose this picture of uh, we had a debate about whether they're lupins or lupines. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is I grew up in uh, originally Reading, Vermont. We're seeing these alongside the road and definitely contributed to my love and appreciation for the outdoors. Just a gentle reminder to include your pronouns please, as you introduce yourself. It's, yeah, you can. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so someone online willing to go? Susanna? Hi, everybody. I'm Susanna Davis, um, the executive director of racial equity for the state. I use she series pronouns. I'm here on the interagency, but I think I also am on the advisory council because I'm greedy and I love meetings. So I... Um, <laughs> I really just looked around and grabbed the first thing that was least that was least likely to cause an avalanche of papers around me. And I ended up um, with this book that I think reflects me because it, it's called La Oveja Negra y Demás Fabulas, which is the, the Black Sheep and Other Fables. Um, and they're actually hilarious. And I'm gonna I'm gonna read one to you. Um I'll translate it because it's written in uh, in Spanish, which is my my mother long uh, tongue. Um, and it says, in one of them, it says, um, one time a lightning bolt struck the same spot a second time, but it found that the first lightning bolt had already done sufficient damage and that it wasn't necessary. And so it got very depressed. And the reason that I, <laughs> and the reason that I really like this object, and I think that this is reflective of me is because one, again, it, it, it's another thing that ties me to my culture, which in Vermont, it can be hard to find. And two, because it is funny and also dark and silly, but also kind of real. And I think that what's funny in this particular fable that I just read to you is that um, it assigns uh, personality to the ecology in a way that people are not accustomed to. And so I really like that. Thank you. Blair. Um, so back to the room and on to you. Uh, hi, so Stephanie Smith, she, her pronouns, um, representing Vermont Emergency Management on the interagency panel. And I picked this photo of a canoe on top of a car because I'm very excited about the snow and getting to play outside, but also really looking forward to getting out of the water. Mm -hmm. I'm Grace, uh, she, her pronouns. I'm representing Commissioner Hanford at ACCD. Um, I chose this because it reminded me of the Doofenstone Pinnacle and I need it to be fall. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to teams, uh, Brittany or Walter? Brittany, thank you. Yes, hi, I am Brittany Watson. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Environmental Justice Network uh, Manager for Rights and Democracy. And so, I looked around and I looked at my phone and I have an image here of my kids. <laughs> and this photo was taken um, right by Lake Champlain. And so for me, I was born and raised in Vermont, uh, grew up in Bennington and um, 
big part of, of my life right now is being a mom. So, and um, wanting to be here and participate in creating a better future. So, um, happy to be here. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Mariam Shabira Basti, and uh, I'm on uh, Environmental Justice Council, and uh, my pronouns are she. Uh, I'm actually from Pakistan, and I've been working over there uh, on the environment uh, in advisory uh, role to on climate change. And uh, I belong to the country which has been impacted uh, by the emissions created by the countries like US and others. And so very much victim of climate injustice practically. And I chose uh, this image uh, not because uh, I have been born and raised here, but recently before I used it. So I'm not sure if that image is from there. I really love uh, fall over here and generally uh, I'm a nature person, so I love nature and I love to conserve it. So it's a beautiful image, that's why I chose. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Mariana. I am originally from Argentina, and that's why I chose this photo. I'll tell you about that. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here uh, representing Tiger Tribunal as the food security advisor for the advisor for the environmental advisor. Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for non-native speakers, all these things and acronyms. Anyways, um, I said. Yeah, pronoun. Yeah, okay. And so this is their their Argentina has one of the biggest falls in the world. It was so falls that are in the limit with Paraguay and Brazil. And I've been there and it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. So if you ever get a chance to go there, it this picture reminds me of it. And then I chose this one too, because I'm a mom and a mom of four, four kids. And this makes me think of the tenderness of motherhood and uh, the bravery too, and the power that you need for being a mother in, in this world. And I love tigers. So uh, having said that, I pass it to you because you want to be Great. We'll go back to teams, I think. So I just want to ask folks to make sure you're speaking up um, and articulately. There's two mics, but sometimes it is translating a little. Um, it's been a, a challenge for some of our own online participants. So. Yeah, I think there's a, a microphone on that table and here. I also yeah. think we're having network issues oh. across the state, so okay. it's flowing yeah. down is a little challenge, which yeah. we can't change. But make sure you're speaking up so everybody can hear you. Yeah, please, Thank please keep letting Stephanie know, and she'll signal us. Okay, um, Walter, are you willing to go? Yes, can you hear me? OK, yes. thank you. Hello, um, I'm Walter Brownridge. He, his, him pronouns. Um, I just first want to say that um, I really wish I could be there in person, but I'm glad to join on teams and anything I um, miss by not being in the room with you. You all can just say that's karma because I'm joining you from Jacksonville, Florida, where I'm attending. <laughs> A work conference. So while I'm not enjoying winter in um, Burlington, where I live, or Montpelier, where you all are, um, it, you know, things just come around. Um, and I'm here for, for the conference I'm attending is work. Um, for this process, I, I'm just Walter. Um, I, I noticed I'm a member of the advisory council, and I noticed um, I was appointed through the speaker's office, but I noticed it said Reverend Brownridge. I am an Episcopal priest. I work for Bishop Shannon McVeigh Brown as her chief of staff in the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont, um, which covers the whole state, 44 congregations. But I'm just Walter here um, and I'm looking forward to the work. And I, I don't know if you can see, but on my phone, I've got an image that you might be able to hold on note. Um, this is of sadly my late departed dog who actually died two years ago this month, my first day on the job here. Um, her name was Misty and um, I, I selected her because um, part of the reason I'm here in this conference is I'm representing the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation, which is based in South Africa. Uh, I served uh, there for several years in the aughts. 
and then continue and continue a relationship I had with the Tutus and others in South Africa. And Misty, who lived to be 17 years old, we got her, my, my kids are all fully grown now, my, my wife of 40 years, but we got Misty when we lived in South Africa as a puppy and she got to travel the world, was to live um, not only in her native South Africa, but in Tennessee, Hawaii, Michigan, Wisconsin, and uh, six days in Vermont. So um, I think about her and just about her as a global person, uh, a canine, um, but also what I learned particularly about the natural world living in Cape Town and our call, as the, arch, the arch as we used to call him, um, about the connectivity of creation and our us being part of creation. So I look forward to the work here. Thank you. Okay. My name is Gail Pezzo. I'm here for the advisory committee. I use she and her pronouns. Um, I live in Colchester in a mobile home community. So I'm here hoping to represent many of the mobile home communities in the state of Vermont. When you asked us to look for a photo, I'm originally from Long Island, New York. And although I kept on pushing this one away, because <laughs> I really wanted just animals, because I'm an animal lover and I used to raise parrots, and I have 10 parrots now. Wow. This one kept on coming over to me because my roots are New York. No, I don't have an accent, you all do. <laughs> Although I'm from Long Island and I'm only living here in Vermont for six years, I never knew what Flatlander meant <laughs> until I was called a Flatlander. So this kind of reminded me of where my roots are and that I am a New Yorker that now is very pleased to be living in Vermont. Also, what it reminded me of is the diversity in New York or in other places that it is really a culture shock for someone like me, because like you said, it's not, it's not an accident that Vermont looks the way that it does. And that is very, very different for me. Hi everyone, my name's Abby Willard. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the development division director at the Agency of Agriculture and Food and Markets and the representative to the interagency committee. So Polly and I were both looking at these photos. Um, so this is an angler kind of um, fishing in a river. You can imagine being somewhere in Vermont. And I'm not an angler fisherwoman at all. And I probably should eat more fish in my diet than I do. But what I actually was drawn to in this picture was this, the relationship between humans and the environment. And so much of my career has been spent trying to like find that balance that that like we are on this landscape, like we can't manage, in my opinion, kind of like a preserved environment, but more of an actively managed landscape and recognize that that human activity and behavior is included. And we just have to really be conscious and more conscious than we probably have been about the impact both on the people and and on the resources. So. Um, anyone else on Teams or was that everybody? I see a lot of guests who are listening in um, and we'll le definitely open it up for public comment later, but are we missing anybody from the? Okay, great. So we're gonna stay in the room. I hope you can, uh, maybe we can make the camera go this way eventually. Um, Jennifer. Hi, my name's Jennifer Byrne. I'm here as a uh, appointee from, uh, to the EJ Advisory Council from the Natural Resource Conservation Council. Um, so I'm a representative of the conservation districts. I'm one of the district managers down in uh, Orange and Windsor County. Um, and I chose this picture. It just sort of jumped out to me because it's my color with the polar bear. Um, and also just how the polar bear has been sort of this mascot of environmentalism. So it jumped out at me for that reason. And then Keisha reminded me, and we play off each other, so I'm going to steal a little bit, but she reminded me of this quote from Van Jones that we're, we're not going to get people to care about the polar bears if they don't have food on their plate. 
Um, so it's just sort of that reminder of why we're here and why we're talking about such a broad array of different agencies, purviews in this context of environmental justice. By MCW and the Lewisi Lisal and the one fantastic actor is a Can we go down now? Uh, and the uh, one fantastic actor and the uh, Odalik. My name is Rich Holshu. I'm called Rich. I am known by those who see me. I wouldn't be here if you weren't here. Think about that. We are in community and we enable each other. Uh, this is the way I try to approach things. I'm here as a representative for the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, one of the statutory seats uh, to represent for the Native community in state. Um, we bring a different perspective. Uh, you may find it puzzling, but I'm going to try to share it with you as we go along. Pronouns I use in the Beneke language, I am Awani. I am someone who is not a gendered language. Uh, we look in terms of spirit and uh, relationship to each other. In English, you know, as, as that language works in a different way. The picture I have here is tiny, but it's uh, two parts. And uh, to me, this, this speaks of home. This is where I am. This is what I am. I want to introduce myself to you in the language I say that I am this place. I'm not from this place. And that is how uh, I want I want to look at things. I choose to look at things, and I am instructed to look at things by traditional teachings. Um, when we get into the, the, the meat here, when we talk about community and individuals, I am thinking far beyond the humans. Environmental justice is more about justice to the environment than to us. That's anthropocentric. So this is home. We have hills, we have sky, the place where the worlds meet. This is where the past and the future and the present coincide. And uh, that's where we are together. So thank you. Thank you. We're, okay, so it's just in the room now. <laughs> yes, we're just in the room, sorry, yes. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Ellerman, she, her pronouns, and I'm with the Agency of Natural Resources. I have sort of some experience working with Act 154, so I'm here to sort of um, facilitate on that in that regard, as well as just general um, legal topics that might come up um, for the interagency committee and for the advisory council. Um, as Keisha mentioned, I went to the Rubenstein School and have been really engrossed in um, study uh, of natural resources and the environment and policy related to that for a long time. Um, I picked out this picture, which is um, the eaves of, of an older building, which sort of stood out for a number of reasons. I have connections to sort of architecture and building. Um, in my family, um, both my father and my brother in the um, home building industry. Um, I obviously spent a lot of my time focusing on the natural environment, open space, et cetera, but um, I you know, tend to go through, through life and looking through um, you know, my spaces, um, having sort of a, a sense of place and an eye toward um, what's around us and how we interact with it. Um, sort of similar to Rich, but you know, focusing on places that um, people tend to live. Um, and I, I happen to notice that within this um, picture, you can see chipping um, paint, which is likely lead-based paint on a, a side of a building, which being an um, environmental attorney working in um, environmental regulation is something on my mind. That that picture of the wastewater system also stands out. I work on that kind of stuff. Um, so I, um, yeah, and it's one, you know, especially walking around Burlington or really so many other communities in Vermont um, that have these historic old um, um, poorly maintained buildings. Um, sort of thinking about um, what it's doing to our soils, um, our air, 
um, what we're breathing and touching on a daily basis. So I'm sure it's quite a bit. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I am Amy Redman. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a health equity lead at the Department of Health. Feeling quite humbled to be sharing space with you all. Um, trying to find my words. Um, I'm with the interagency uh, committee. And the image that I selected was a bowl of blueberries because when I looked at it, um, I had an image of my two kiddos at we just have a couple of blueberry bushes at our house and I had an image of them just going out to nourish their bodies and the abundance that comes from that and just the, the contentment that I have when I see them out. Um, hi, I'm Sabina Haskell. I'm the chair of the Natural Resources Board. Um, she, her, uh, I have been there about a year and over, just over a year, year, five, three months. But anyway, I picked the greenhouse growing plants because every year at this time, I think about what I want to grow on my deck and how I'm going to be a better <laughs> gardener this year than I was last year. <laughs> and I'm hoping this will be the year that I'll actually get some tomatoes and such. <laughs> that was why I picked it. Yeah. Hola, um, my name is Carla and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I work with the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, my role is uh, the Director of Civil Rights and Environmental Justice. And I first just want to share with you how excited I am to be sitting here amongst all of you. It's a great honor and pleasure really, and I'm just ecstatic about um, what the future holds for all of us here and for Vermonters. Um, and the picture I picked is this. I am originally from Puerto Rico, born and raised, and um, this is a beach and of course, the the flora does not look anything like what you would find <laughs> in a beach in Puerto Rico, but there's the ocean, the sand. Um, and I picked this um, not only because it reminds me of the beaches in Puerto Rico where, you know, I used to go quite frequently, um, but also because in Puerto Rico is where I lived environmental justice. And um, after going to law school, uh, I decided to move to New York and go back to school for a master's in law. And during that master's in, in law is where I discovered that what I was living was, was environmental justice. I get emotional. <laughs> um, and so I am just very humbled and just really excited about doing this work for Vermonters um, in your company. And hopefully, you know, we can make a difference together. Um, but thank you for what being here has allowed me to, to do and be. <laughs> I feel like that deserved a deep breath. <laughs> No, you guys are doing some good <laughs> intros. I know, intros. that's me. <laughs> yeah, emotion. Uh, I'm Clay McClaveny. I am she, her pronouns. I am the data and equity policy manager at the Department of Public Service. So I serve on the interagency committee. Um, I picked a picture of beets. Amy and I duked it out over the blueberries as well. Um, but beets are one of my favorite things to eat out of the garden. I also happen to be very bad at growing them myself. Um, but I, I didn't envision myself, interestingly, in the career in the environmental sphere, but it's where most of my childhood, I feel like most of my childhood memories are um, in a garden, outside of nature. It's where I feel most at peace. Um, so I feel like something in the universe kind of pushed me towards this as my career. 
I believe because my family had me outside from a young age. So um grateful to finding myself even though I didn't envision it. So uh and grateful to be here with all of you. Hi everyone, I'm Polly Major. I'm from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And in the future, you'll probably see my colleague Trey Martin, but I'm feeling very grateful that Trey was not able to be here today. <laughs> and so I get the opportunity to meet you all and work with you all on this. Uh -huh. I chose this picture of a fisherman out in some really bad weather. And like Abby, I am not a fisherman, uh, but I chose it for two reasons. One is I really love when you're caught outside in terrible weather and make it work. I grew up working on my uncle's sheep farm and there was one day it was pouring rain and we were herding sheep. And he turned to me and said, this is what foul weather gear is for. <laughs> so this just reminded me of that. The other reason I liked it is uh, it reminds me of Northwest Scotland where there is both foul weather and fishing. Mm -hmm. And my name, if you ever see it written out, is spelled P-O-L-L-A-I-D-H and it's just pronounced Polly. And that's because I'm named after a mountain in Northwest Scotland, so it's Gaelic. Uh, so it just had a tie into that as well. <laughs> and she, her pronouns. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. And even though we've blown through the time on our agenda, <laughs> I just want to recognize that this, what you just did, is really important. And I'm so grateful. I think I share everybody's gratitude to get to know you all a little bit and to be in the presence of such amazing human beings with a wealth of expertise. Um, so my name is Jessica Savage. As I mentioned, I use she, her pronouns, and I work for the Council on Rural Development. The Council on Rural Development, we're an independent, nonpartisan nonprofit, um, and we show up when asked to facilitate all kinds of community conversations, public uh, convenings, policy councils, all kinds of places where Vermonters are gathering and trying to think about what their future should look like. So we're, you know, we do these kind of things all the time. And at the same time, given the fact that we're here to talk about environmental justice or really any kind of justice means that you're recognizing that there has been harm, there has been injustice, right? And we are a white-led organization. I am a well-meaning white lady, <laughs> so what you get <laughs> um, sometimes in this space. Um, but, you know, we really, I just wanted to say that. Maybe it's not necessary, but I think it's important um, to recognize that nothing about this work. Yes, Carl? Just really quickly, sure. I would like to introduce um, Phoebs. Oh. Uh, uh, environmental justice coordinator for the Agency of Natural Resources. Yeah, so you first hire, uh, thanks to, oh, Senator Round left, but <laughs> to the work, um, and Jennifer, of course. Um, I am ecstatic uh, to have Thieves, and um, his first day is April 5th, but he just wanted to, to come here and meet you all. Um, but yeah, you're going to be seeing more of him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I lost a little bit of what I was saying, but the, the point is that, uh, you know, we are here to just hold the space for you all today. We're endeavoring to do that today. Um, but it's your time. This is, this is the beginning of your journey, their map to the next world, if you want to think of it. Um, and it's big work. And I'm just really grateful for all of the people who are here. I think we have to recognize people who aren't here, as we heard uh, Senator Ron Hensdale recognize. There's voices that have been speaking up and, and they're not here today. We should recognize that. Um, and there are people who maybe felt they couldn't be here today or wouldn't be here today. And so that's important to recognize too. I also want to say today, you're all equals, okay? If that isn't obvious by the way we're setting it up, there is an interagency group and there is an advisory council. You're a team today, you're a joint, committee. Um, and you all represent a ton of different types of expertise, often in the same person. So I just want, we've heard that already today, but it's it's very much on my mind. And only because you showed up are we going to be successful. So thank you again uh, for doing that. Um, so we are, and thank you to the members of the public who are here. And like I said, there'll be a moment at the end. I see a bunch of state folks too. And thank you for being here. I know a lot of you are doing uh, big work as well. So uh, we'll have a public comment at the end, but otherwise we're going to dive right into our agenda today. Um, but before I do that, I did want to um, 
propose a few draft group agreements for you all to consider. You're going to get a chance at the end of the day today uh, to reflect on these. And I'm going to read these out loud, folks, on, on Teams. If you can't, I know you can't see them. Um, but I do think, as you've heard already, this is work that comes from the heart for a lot of people. It's work that raises a lot of feelings. So having some group agreements that kind of create this safe container, as safe a container as we can, is really important. Um, so uh, these draft group agreements, there's just three of them. One is be present. That means being present with your body, being present with your feelings. Uh, if you need to take a break or take care of yourself, please do. We have a room down the hallway through the kitchen over there where if you need to take a break uh, and, and have a moment to yourself, it's available for that. We might have we might have some family uh, who's here with with my two year old son. It might be a two year old in there, but that might be just the kind of break that you need. Um, and uh, really, it is a it is a a BIPOC affinity space if needed. Um, so if if you're if if that's what's needed, we're going to make space for that. Okay, um, folks on Teams, same thing. If you need to turn off your camera, take a little break, that's totally fine. I see folks are doing that now. Um, and there are restrooms both out there in the hallway and over there. Again, you don't have to ask permission, just go take a break. There's food over there. Being present also means that you're doing it right now awesomely. So I don't even have to say it. it means keeping your phones away, keeping your laptops away. I know some of you are very busy people. If you need to take care of a call or something, you can go out either side there. That room is also free right now, anyways. Yeah, it's free. It's free. I was given to opt for my son, that's why. That's <laughs> um, So our second one is uh, calling in and calling out. Uh, and followed up by assuming best intent, but attending to impact. So that means that in this space, we can stop things that are being said that are harmful, and we can say, ouch, stop, that's calling out. We can call in too, we can assume best intent, and maybe say, hmm, I'm curious about why you might have said that, uh, and, and that is welcome to happen at any time today, okay? Um, and, and if you're on the receiving end of either of those things, which we all have then, well, it's normal, um, it's attending to impact. Maybe you didn't mean to say it. Maybe you didn't realize that the way you said something is even a thing. But someone gave you the gift of saying, hey, that's not cool. And you should say, thanks, I'm learning, right? So that's that's the kind of space we're, we're endeavoring to create today. And then the third group agreement is expect and accept non-closure. The fact that we're overdue on our agenda, we're unlikely to leave here today feeling like 100% ready to go, right? And some of the topics that we're going to talk about today are big and they're heavy, and you're going to have to work more. Um, we're not going to reach a tidy bow on every single thing today. If it was easy, it would already be done. So it's not, and that's okay. Sound good? Any questions about understanding these group agreements? Folks on Teams, did you hear what I hear it all? Thumbs up? Okay. All right, so with that, our agenda, which just ignore the times because apparently that's what we're going to do today. I will get you up by four, I promise. I promise. Okay, so, uh, and you only have to get to 210 to get a break. So listen up. <laughs> but we are dividing our day up into three main questions the why, the what, and the how. And we are using Act 154 as a map or a framework for those questions. Okay. And as uh, Senator Ron Hinsdale reminded us, this law, while it exists and is very important, is just that. It's a framework and a map, and it can change, and it likely will. In fact, your work in the Act is being asked to recommend changes to it. So it's just something we're going to use um, so that by the end of today, one of the goals is that you feel like you've seen and felt and touched all the aspects of the work that you're being asked to do, and that you feel more grounded and ready to go to do that work, okay? I'm sure all of you have read Act 154 or looked at the presentation that we shared. Today, I hope you leave with a deeper understanding of why it's important and what you're going to do about it, okay? And then by the end of the day, I hope that you also leave with a few next steps, some actions that you're like, okay, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z to get going, okay? Um, so to get us started, we're going to start with the why. We've heard a little bit in our introductions here about some of your whys, why you're here, why this work resonates with you. Um, but there are a lot of reasons why this work might also resonate with you around the wall and on the printout in front of you. Okay. 
So what we're going to do is I'd like to uh, go back and forth between teams in the room again, and we're going to read out loud all 19 findings in Act 154. Stephanie. Yes. I did at the beginning. Do I need to say it again? I just wanted to make sure I, I missed, missed it. I just wanted to That's okay. No, I did. I uh, We changed the agenda to add a public comment period at the end and moved up some of the activities at lunch. And while we are slightly overdue on some of the items, all of the items that are on the current agenda are going to happen. Um, so the only change for folks online is at 1245, or sorry, 1245, 345, there'll be a public comment period. Okay. Um, so can we kind of go back and forth like we did before to read the findings? And uh, folks on Teams, do you have the findings in front of you? You can either look at the uh, link to Act 154 or um, we sent it to you. Does everyone have it online? Yes. Okay, good. I see a thumbs up from Brittany. Great. Okay, so we're going to do uh two in the room one on teams same as before three in the room one how about three in the room one on teams same as before and we'll start on this side of the room holly would you read finding number one for us sure according to american journal of public health studies published in 2014 and 2018 and affirmed by decades of research black indigenous and people of color BIPOC, and individuals with low income are disproportionately exposed to environmental hazards and unsafe housing, facing higher levels of air and water pollution, mold, lead, and pests. The cumulative impacts of environmental harms disproportionately and adversely impact the health of BIPOC and communities with low income, with climate change functioning as a threat multiplier. These disproportionate adverse impacts are exacerbated by lack of access to affordable energy, healthy food, green spaces, and other environmental benefits. Since 1994, Executive Order 12898 has required federal agencies to make achieving environmental justice part of their mission by identifying and addressing disproportionately high and adverse human health or environmental effects of its programs, policies, and activities on minority populations and populations with low income in the United States. Uh, Brittany, are you willing to read number four finding? Thank you. Yes. Uh, sorry, I just need to go back into it. Okay. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 30% of Vermont towns with high town household poverty have limited access to grocery stores. In addition, a study conducted at the University of Vermont showed that in Vermont, BIPOC individuals were twice as likely to have trouble affording fresh food and to go hungry in a month than white individuals. Inadequate transportation impedes job access, narrowing the scope of jobs available to individuals with low income and potentially impacting job performance. In 2020, the Center for American Progress found that 76% of BIPOC individuals in Vermont live in nature-deprived census tracts with a higher proportion of natural areas lost to human activities than the Vermont median. In contrast, 27% of white individuals live in these areas. Rich? Number seven. Yeah, number seven, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention states that systemic health and social inequities disproportionately increases the risk of racial and ethnic minority groups becoming infected by and dying from COVID-19. Number eight, Walter. Oh, you're muted. Hi, I'm sorry. I thought I had the actual findings, but I think I just I ended up downloading my accident. Just the oh. summary part. Sorry, oh, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm looking. I'm trying to locate it right now. I'm sorry. Yes, um, that's all right. Uh, June June is willing to read this one and we'll come back to you. OK, thank you. 
According to the Vermont Department of Health, inequities in access to and quality of health care, employment, and housing have contributed to disproportionately high rates of COVID-19 among the BIPOC Vermonters. Back in the room, Jennifer. An analysis by University of Vermont researchers found that mobile homes are more likely than permanent structures to be located in a flood hazard area. During Tropical Storm Irene, mobile, home, mobile parks and over 561 mobile homes in Vermont were damaged or destroyed. Mobile homes make up 7.2% of all housing units in Vermont and were approximately 40% of the sites affected by Tropical Storm Irene. Uh, finding 10, a University of Vermont study reports that BIPOC individuals were seven times more likely to have gone without heat in the past year, over two times more likely to have trouble affording electricity, and seven times less likely to own a solar panel than white Vermonters. Am I 10? Yeah. 11. Uh, 11. No, 11, sorry. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency recognized Vermont's deficiencies in addressing environmental justice concerns related to legacy mining and mobile home park habitability, providing grants for these projects in 1998 and 2005. Walter, did you find it? Yes. Would you um, read number 12? Vermont state agencies receiving federal funds are subject to the anti-discrimination requirements of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Finding 13. In response to the documented inadequacy of the state and federal environmental and land use laws to protect vulnerable communities, increasing number of states have adopted formal environmental justice laws and policies. Uh, 14. At least 17 states have developed mapping tools to identify environmentally overburdened communities and environmental health disparities. The state of Vermont does not currently have a state managed mapping tool that clearly identifies environmentally overburdened. Back online if, if Suzanne is available to do that. She sure is. The Thank you. 1990. 1991 Principles of Environmental Justice adopted by the First National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit demand the right of all individuals to participate as equal partners at every level of decision making, including needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. Article 7 of the Vermont Constitution establishes the government as a vehicle for the common benefit, protection, and security of Vermonters, and not for the particular emoluments or, or advantage of any single set of persons who are only a part of that community. This, coupled with Article 1's guarantee of equal rights to enjoy life, liberty, and safety, Article 4's assurance of timely justice for all, encourages political officials to identify how particular communities may be unequally burdened or receive unequal protection under the law due to race, income, or geographic location. Lack of a clear environmental justice policy has resulted in a piecemeal approach to understanding and addressing environmental justice in Vermont and creates a barrier to establishing clear definitions, metrics, and strategies to ensure meaningful engagement and more equitable distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. It is the state of Vermont's responsibility to pursue environmental justice for its residents and to ensure that its agencies do not contribute to unfair distribution of environmental benefits to or, to or environmental burdens on low income, limited English proficient and BIPOC communities. Thank you. So, <clears throat> 19 findings here in the room we have them up on the wall starting with 1 through 19. What I'd like you to do is take a moment see which one of those really punched you in the gut which one really made you feel something preferably if you want to go all professional and be like this is the thing that I'm working on great but I'm more interested in you telling each other which one really really made you feel something or made you see somebody you know or yourself see your family see your friends in this yes 
Right. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I was interested to know because it's been a year in Vermont after moving here, so I yeah. might not have all the technical knowledge. I was interested to know about the 17 states that have developed mapping tools. Who are those 17 states? Does anyone have name or anything? We we do we do know that, um, but today and I, I didn't mention these tools, but you might come up with all kinds of questions today throughout. There's kind of a lot of technical stuff in front of you, um, so we're gonna. I have a parking lot. I'll put it up on the wall. We'll write that down and make sure that the agency gets back to you with that answer. But yes, sorry, I don't mean to not answer your question, but I can't. So, um, so the uh, so like I said, there's 19 findings around the room. I want you to go stand by the one. It's hard to choose your, your, your least favorite or your most favorite. I don't know how to put it, but uh, go to the one that really stuck to your heart. Those on Teams, uh, same thing. I really invite you to think of the one. Uh, you could put it in the, put it in the chat, uh, the number of the, of the finding that spoke yeah. to you. When you get to this place that you're going to stand, you're going to share share why why did this stick you why did this make you feel something with your neighbor somebody close by somebody at the same uh finding those online uh is there a way we can mute us so they can have a conversation about that so they don't so we don't hear them and you're not hearing our cacophony <laughs> okay stephanie's going to try to make it so that the four of you can have a conversation on teams okay Yes, can you hear me, Stephanie? This is me in response to your chat. And uh, this is June. I guess we should start talking unless Walter, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. And Brittany, how about you? Great, OK. Um, Brittany, are you still thinking about which findings spoke to you? And just thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. <laughs> I so I many. I, I'll, I'll add one. And uh, is is Jean with us or no? Jean. Jean will weigh in. So. Looks like we were pretty much all in the same neighborhood, 16 and 17. Um, I can say, oh. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Susanna. I was just going to say why 17 stuck out to me was because it talks about it in terms of it being, uh, wait, am I? Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I actually read the wrong one. I meant 16. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> and the reason that that one stuck out to me was because it it talks about the it being a demand, which to me was interesting because government rarely acknowledges demands. And if they do, it's usually in the context of this was a hostage situation and we had to raise the building. Um, so I thought that was important because it is it it's an important step, I think, of acknowledging not just what the community says, but uh, the the level of. Um, I don't know the word, you know what I'm saying? Well, that there's a mandate as opposed to a request. Yeah. So I, I thought it was interesting that that language would be included here and acknowledged as a demand. Um, did, I, I, I'm looking, I'm seeing my chat. I typed in 16, but I'm, I'm trying to find everyone else's remarks and maybe I'm in the, in the wrong. I think you're the right place. Everybody went for 16 except me. I went for 17. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just piggyback on Susanna's comment. I, I, th the, the fact that uh, this is 32 years and people have been actually dealing, recognizing this for a long time. Um, for me, part of the issue, frankly, is that it's, this is not a new thing. And yet 
um, I know from people who were very active in this time period how difficult it was to get not only the government's attention, whether local, state, or federal, especially federal, but also even within the environmental community in many ways. So that's why I selected it, that this is a historic problem, which of course makes it very difficult because it's still very much prevalent today, as the other findings have pointed out. Brittany, how about you? Yeah, so for me, I I chose finding 16, um, similarly with the language that's used in it and recognizing um, my own passion and wanting to ensure that all voices are heard at the table. And, um, and so I really appreciate that this is considered a demand, right? And I also appreciate that it's um, understanding that uh, there needs to be all individuals need to be equal partners at every level of decision making and um, to include the assessment planning and implementation um, in particular, because I feel like that's this work is the work that's going to allow us to begin to advance environmental justice in Vermont. Okay, well, I think um, 17 spoke to me because I see it as weaving a very powerful argument for the proposition that um, government is a living thing and it needs to reflect what the people demand and we need to be we need to live up to what these documents say and this finding i think brings that home we're supposed to be doing this on 16 i would just offer the following observation um i think i would have edited this to say demand that all individuals be able to participate because you have always had the right. We've always had the right. Our government hasn't always been the government that has facilitated that participation. So demanding that the government live up to its obligations, demanding that the government um, put reality behind our rights, I think is a very powerful thing. Um, but there, there was never a question that anybody had the right to this. It's making it real that has been the hard um, thing. And that's so what, what we're, we're going to do. I just here. love to hear from a couple of folks, you know, what that what that felt like, what you're noticing, any aha moments, if someone's willing to share, like what that felt like to share about your why you're finding. Yes, over here. I can go. Sure. I'm Grace. Um, I work at ACCD as the environmental officer reviewing the federal environmental compliance for all of our Community development block grants. We give out a lot of money to home ownership centers who have home repair loan programs to help low and moderate income people fix up their mobile homes, you know, get a new well, et cetera. And we and they have to send in pictures of their homes and of the repairs needed. And some of these people, one person didn't have water, she needed the form put through immediately, like dire straits, basically. And I graduated from UVM in 2014. I live in Colchester, living paycheck to paycheck, but then I see, you know, these people. And it's just really, since coming to ACCD, it's really widened my eyes to how many people are really living on the fringes, how there are these programs set up, but they don't go quick enough. There might not be enough money. They are living with mold and lead. I can see it in the pictures. So sorry to babble on, but. This is what I look at every day. This is why I have to do Um, how about folks on teams? Any anyone want to share how that felt to have that conversation with each other or any aha moments? You don't have to. Okay. Well, I'll always talk, but these people are all very articulate. <laughs> I just think we're maybe being a little shy. Um I, I, but, Go ahead, Walter. I just we thought it was interesting that we all either finding 16 and that we all were on the or 17. That 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 was our discussion just about how that resonated with the systems and that the language was unique and that's going back 32 years about demand. So that, that was all I was going to add. Thank you. Um, at last, any last reflections? Yes, Jennifer. 
Uh, well, full disclosure, I, I was um, led the team at Vermont Law School that drafted these findings, and it's just like a great moment. <laughs> and I care about every one of these. That 17, I mean, it comes right out of the Constitution, but it also came out of my, my thesis, so I'm happy about that one too. Yeah. This, though, I'm not surprised that the Department of Education representative came over and sat under this mm -hmm. um, point about Title VI and the Civil Rights Act. Um, I think because with the Department of Ed, it's so tangible how how that works in effect and mm -hmm. the requirements of having language access plans and the need for community engagement plans. Yeah, I think that it's really important. And it's a short one and one sentence, but it has so much in there that, you know, the Civil Rights Act is already the law and it's not in use really in the state. It hasn't really been. Yeah, and then we have to our requirements under that. So um, yeah, that's why I'm over here. Good. Well, I'm glad you see your work. <laughs> we tried to use multicolors to bring it to bring it to life here. Um, not a lot of I don't know, people don't pay attention to the findings and bills a lot, but these are important ones. Um, so I think you should pay attention. <laughs> um, okay, so this is our why. Thus concludes the end of our why section um, for today, and we're going to move on to the what and we're going to start um, start by uh, talking about the definition. So there's there's importance placed on the definitions in this bill. They're always important, but they're particularly important because you could almost consider them draft at this time. Part of your work is going to be considering these definitions because they're going to have a legal effect at some point. And so I just want to draw your attention very closely to these definitions. And we're going to do an activity where we're going to have four groups in the room and one you're going to be a teams group. And we're going to take a look at the definitions. Um, you're going to move into we've got four definitions in the room and we group together five and six into the last one. Four and five are grouped. Sorry. Four and five are <laughs> if you're looking at Act 154. You're looking Okay. Four and five groups uh, together as okay. one. Okay, so there's five. Yeah, okay, so there's five total, but definitions four and five represent that yeah. fifth one. Right. Okay, so uh, in the room, we're going to count off by fours, if that sounds good. Um, and we'll start with Polly and then Rich in the back, kind of like that. Okay. One, two, three, four. You said count to four. Count to four. On one, two, three, four. One, two, four, one, two, three, four, one. Two. Okay, so it's not great math, sorry. Um, <laughs> but there's four groups, and that's fine. Two of them will be a little, a little bigger. So we'll have uh, ones over here. We'll have twos. Don't move yet. Ones over here, twos over there, threes over there. We'll just be in the four corners, right? One, two, three, four, and then you guys are five online. Uh, Laura is going to hand all of the ones, twos, threes, and fours some definitions. Your job is to read it out loud. Somebody volunteer, read it out loud. Then you're going to say, in common English, what does this mean? Have a conversation. And I want you to come up with a way to explain it to the rest of the group. So you're going to write down uh, in common English and sort of plain language what that definition means. Um, what does that mean? What is the meaning of this definition to you? Okay. Not that it's like that complicated, but it, it's, it's some of them are big, right? They're meaty. Um, okay, so Laura will come around once you clump into one, two, three, four. Folks on teams, you get four and five together, and you're going to do the same activity. And we'll mute it so it's not really loud in your ears. Yeah. Um, number six. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're doing definition number six. Thank goodness for Laura, or I don't know what it is. Yes. So you are all going to do uh, definition number six. It's e 454 Let us know if you need us to gather to get it to you. I going to put the definition. Right. Oh, I can use this face here. I'm going to 
So in my mind, just to bring all images are affordable and this is Yeah, just waiting for a form. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Okay. So, so you can see the Yeah, they have six. They have six. So the good news is I've looked at number six. Uh, the bad news is I'm not entirely sure what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> My understanding is that we need to um, put the definition in um, common English language. Common English. Okay. Let's have a look. I, yes. Uh, I grew up in Germany and I went to school in Germany and learned a lot of my critical reasoning, whatever, in German. So long sentences, long paragraphs are my familiar way of communicating to the disappointment of many people. So simplifying this is going to be very challenging. <laughs> and and any anybody who wants to take the lead on that, I'm right behind you. Yes, Walter, go for it. You're muted, Walter. in language. OK, thank you. So I couldn't get to the screen for the type or um, keypad or something. Um, well, I, I'm not only a priest, but I was also a lawyer. So yeah, words are a lot. It's not my I'm not going to be the best wordsmith necessarily, but what I notice in this definition, the sixth one, this is meaningful participation, correct? Is that yeah. the one with? Yeah. There are actually three parts. They, there are three times the, the, the term meaningful participation. There are three times. So that's sort of simple that we can at least do that. And so um, the first one is that meaningful participation means all individuals have the opportunity to participate in energy, climate change, and environmental decision making. Um, and then that includes examples, needs assessment, planning, implementation, per permitting, compliance, and enforcement and evaluation. So I guess it's, if the idea is meaningful in common English, um, I, this is more of a question. Are they saying that everyone, and we're, we're, I'm just assuming everyone in the state, every citizen or resident, every resident or citizen of Vermont needs to be able to have some at least the opportunity to give their input on these issues of energy, climate change, and environmental decision making. And, and so that might mean is a needs assessment, you know, sounds like, you know, a survey or how do you determine that? You know, I mean, um, so I think we may want to just be directly clear that to me that first clause refers to the inclusionary aspect of this, that this will not be just a small group who may serve on the advisory council or on the um, state interagency group, but I could be wrong. So, I mean, so someone else feel free to. I am. Uh, I'm full of admiration, Walter. <laughs> Thank you for going first. I'm also a musician. You, you can't see it here, but my guitar is in the background. 
So one of the ways I compensate for those long clauses is I write music lyrics. And uh, if I had to put this into a music lyric, I would say nothing about anyone state of Vermont without a seat without my being at the table. Right. Especially when it comes to energy, climate change and the environment. And I think nothing about me without me is the essence of it. OK. And the only thing that I hesitate a little bit about is the me. What we're getting at is everybody. So how to how to rephrase that? I don't know that I would go so far as to say nothing about anyone, but um, yeah, nothing about nothing about anyone without anyone when climate, energy, and the environment are on the menu. <laughs> Something like that. Oh come on, you guys! This is deadly serious. We've got a we got to get a vibe going here. Look at that. Brittany, I knew you had a million dollar yeah. smile. <laughs> well, we, you could have said that. So you're, that's your original. So I would have just plagiarized, you know, in the room. Well, go where, for it. <laughs> no, in the room where it happens, you know. That oh, yeah, that's a good one. To be in the room, everyone needs to be. I mean, that's the whole deal about that. Oh, hey, hey, what about this, Walter? Make, make room for everyone in the room. There we are. Make room for everyone in the room where these decisions are made. We're on made. That's right. This, I mean, the, the the question, the refrain. I'm kind of a Hamilton, you know, freak head. Um, is that no one knows how the sausage is made? You know, this is, you know, we just it was just, it's a mystery. But then it, people come out of the room and their decisions. So this is like no one. You said it better. You know. Oh, I like what you said. Make. Make room for everyone in the room. For Make room for everyone in the room. You know, I think I think we're all naturally gravitating towards metaphors and analogies because when I first read this one, the one that came to my mind was, you know, that meaningful participation means you get to have a say in what's for dinner. You get to help prepare dinner, but you also have to help clean dinner up and you get to participate oh, yes. in eating it. Because I, I see it as like- shopping. Don't forget shopping. Right. <laughs> Right. And because, you know, because when you think about it, it's like dinner time is I don't know about you all, but it's my favorite time of day. Right. Or one of them. But and it's also I mean, and part of it is the joy of it. But the other part of it is that there's a responsibility. Right. You can't just sit here and be like, I'm going to make a huge mess with a delicious meal. Well, you know what? Now we got to deal with it. But the other thing I was um, reflecting on while reading this was that it says all individuals. It doesn't actually say which individuals or where, because when I think a lot about Vermont, you know, a lot of times we talk about people of Vermont and we 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 act on behalf of people in the state but it's not just the residents it's also the visitors and the abutters so if you're doing a local zoning something or other your neighbor has the right to be notified that you're going to make a change to your property and they get to weigh in and all that stuff so like if the state of Vermont wants to do something that's ecologically unfriendly does New York have a say does New Hampshire have a say if you're fracking next door you know Oh, but technically we don't live within the boundary, so we don't get a say. But the ecology doesn't really care where our political boundaries are, right? It's going to have an impact if it's going to have an impact. So I'm also thinking about the fact that there's people who have a stake in what we decide here who may not live here. And so how much credence or weight do we choose to, to give those voices? That's and I'm sorry, I'm going to go... I'm going to go back off camera to finish my little salad thing. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, too, because I'm going to be leaving our meeting very shortly to get to get something else. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I think what Susanna just led me to reflect on is the 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 history of exclusion, overlooking su suppression, um, discounting is so deep and so strong that language today in trying to address these problems tends to overcompensate, in my opinion. And what I mean by overcompensate is not that they're going too strong in another direction. It's that um, in trying to express just how essential and imperative it is for there to be positive change and justice um, created and, and realized, there are many foundations that we find ourselves tearing at, and one of them is representational uh, democracy, if you will, or representational decision making. 
it is not possible, in my opinion, to to fully account for everything that Zuzana correctly called out just now as a consideration. Um, but I'm not comfortable simply citing representational democracy. You got to let some people make these decisions uh, as a as a solution or as a tool for for getting at what we're trying to do, which is achieve a more just world that has to begin with more expansive inclusion. Even as I speak, I feel I acutely aware that I need to be quiet. I'm talking too much. Others on this this screen have things to say, and I just wanted to give voice to those thoughts. I appreciate your words, June. I um, I don't think you're talking too much. I I appreciate what you're bringing to the conversation, and for me, I'm also you know wanting to name my process feels a bit different. Like when I'm hearing, let's let's put this language in like common English, <laughs> and I'm thinking like I'm going on um, in my little notepad here, <laughs> trying to like just play on the words and, um, you know, and I know and I recognize um, that Stephanie gave the suggestion that maybe we try reading it out loud. Um, for me, my go to was if I'm speaking to a member in the community um, and consider it to be a marginalized person, right, maybe someone from a low income community or a person of color who has no idea, you know, what environmental justice is, like, how would I explain meaningful participation? And so coming from that, um, I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, if I'm saying meaningful participation, then, you know, obviously you want to discuss the decision making process, but it's, it's the, the way that I feel like needs to be called out. Uh, Explaining We're having something. a little trouble with your microphone, yeah. Brittany. No, Walter, oh. I think it might be you. Oh, it's Walter. Walter. Okay. It might be messing sorry. with your mic. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It was just some papers. Oh, okay. No worries. So for me, I think it's the not just the um like being a part of the decision making process, it's the way that yeah. they're a part of the decision-making process. So for me, it's like a way that honors and respects their time, expertise, and uh, availability or access to resources. And, and I also think like condensing this in a way that is more easily digestible for someone, because even as I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a lot of words. Um, and, and I do EJ work, right? It's like part of my everyday, and I'm still like, this is, this is a lot to try to explain and I and I also understand the intention of it too and wanting to ensure that they're they're speaking about like not leaving anything out um and so and I and I don't know how much time we have left but I also just wanted to see uh oh we're wrapping up okay so um yeah I can uh, I don't mind sharing like my thoughts on it and or anyone else uh, if we want to, because I, I know they're going to ask. So is there anything? Would that... you like to do that, Brittany? Go. Would you like to to speak for what we just said here? And I don't know how, uh, maybe two minutes. Okay, so I said meaningful participation means everyone receives a fair opportunity to be included in the decision making process in a way that honors and respects their time, mm -hmm. expertise and access to resources. Uh, and then I'm, <laughs> I'm happy for anyone to chime in with any edits to that or any additional input. I, I think we should try to hit on something you said at the outset, Brittany, about how in your work, it, your, your process just works differently. And I read this definition and you know what? A bunch of lawyers wrote it. <laughs> and, and, and it tries to cover everything. And sometimes when we deal with these issues, we just get to a point where our language fails us because we we keep forgetting about the need to, to communicate the essence of something as opposed to every last detail that can be tried in court. Uh, so, so, yeah. Go ahead, Walter. I'm sorry. No, I think if we could include... Um, there was a, it was, I think, implied in your statement, Brittany, but I think if we could, that 
expertise, while expertise, there are different forms and expressions of expertise. And um, that second clause really gets to that. Uh, you know, as particularly related to indigenous communities, but others, so that not only does everyone have the opportunity, and that there will be different ways of understanding and expressing um, knowledge that should go into it. And the third clause is really that um, this process is transparent. That's key, and that's what I would just say. That's a, you know would be my additions to the statement. And I would love if Brittany would read the read the um be the one to report back to the sure. larger group. And I also going to I'm sorry. I just going to apologize. I'm going to need to leave at probably around three or three fifteen um, for something I can't miss at this conference. But other than you know, I'll be here until then. So I just popped in um, what I wrote in the chat because I, you know, Great. I like to read through things too sometimes. So meaningful participation means everyone receives a fair opportunity to be included in a transparent decision making process in a way that honors and respects their time, expertise, both lived and professional and access to resources. That is, I think that's a wonderful distillation. And Zariah, I see you've just joined us. Um, oh, why don't we? Um, <laughs> why don't we? Who's got definition number one? Okay. That's okay. It doesn't matter. It's really you're trying to answer the question. Well, what does this mean anyway? What, what the heck does this mean, right? We found out. We just Good. That's great. That's all you had to do. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to hear so yeah. So can you can you first? I'm gonna ask conversations. I know it's hard, but we can't hear if everybody's talking. Sorry. I'm sorry. I know I'm being pushy. Okay, so number definition number one, would you read the actual definition? Please. Yes. Just so you know, uh, Soraya's just joined us all. Oh, day. excellent. So I kind of just gave her a little context, but sure. maybe just reframe it real quick. So sure. On board. Yes. Hi, Zariah. Um, so uh, this room is full of uh, excellent humans who want to meet you, and we'll do that in a moment, maybe when we come back from break. Um, but we're doing definitions right now. So we're uh, really focusing on, we're starting to talk about the what of Act 154 and um, looking at these definitions, particularly because you almost have to consider them draft at this time. Uh, later on, you're going to be asked to give recommendations. Rulemaking will happen. Um, so understanding the definitions now is kind of crucial. And the way we're doing that is by uh, coming up with what does it mean? Uh, having a common language way of explaining what these definitions mean and kind of uh, maybe having your colleagues understand it as well. So that's what we're doing now. And we're starting with definition one. Um, and the Teams folks, you have definition number six. You get to be last. Um, okay, so number one. Okay, uh, number one, environmental benefits means the assets and services that enhance the capability of communities and individuals to function and flourish in society. Examples of environmental benefits include access to a healthy environment and clean natural resources, including air, water, land, green spaces, constructed playgrounds, and other outdoor recreational facilities and venues, affordable, clean, renewable energy sources, public transportation, fulfilling and dignified green jobs, healthy homes and buildings, healthcare, nutritious food, indigenous food and cultural resources, environmental enforcement, and training and funding dispersed or administered by governmental agencies. <laughs> Got that. Got it. Okay, great. So what does that mean anyway? <laughs> Just what you guys think. This is yeah. how we wrote. Okay. Stuff for lawyer. Stuff for everyone. It says good stuff for everyone. Dot dot dot. Always. That's great. 
Good stuff for everyone. Uh, right. Um, okay, who's got definition number two? Two. You two? Two. 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 Which definition? You have definition number two over here. Okay. I can read it. How are we doing on hearing on Teams? Are you able to hear folks? Yeah, okay. It's kind of, okay, so th there's a microphone here. I think there's one here as well. Maybe I'll, no one's over there. Huh. There's two. <laughs> All right, there's a microphone and a chair near them. So um, would you read definition number two and uh, tell us what it means anyway? Environmental burdens means any significant impact to clean air, water, and land, including any destruction, damage, or impairment of natural resources resulting from intentional or reasonably foreseeable causes. Examples of environmental burdens include climate change impacts, air and water pollution, improper sewage disposal, improper handling of solid wastes and other noxious substances, excessive noise, activities that limit access to green spaces, nutritious food, indigenous food or cultural resources, or constructed outdoor playgrounds and other recreational facilities and venues, inadequate remediation of pollution, reduction of groundwater levels, increased flooding or stormwater flows, home and building health hazards, including lead paint, lead plumbing, and asbestos and mold, and damage to inland water bodies and water ways, wetlands, forests, green spaces, or constructed playgrounds, or other recreational facilities and venues from private industrial, commercial, and government operations, or other activities that contaminate or alter the quality of the environment and pose a risk to public. Ooh, okay. <laughs> this is a good number one and two. Those are the big ones, right? All right, so what does it mean anyway? What did you guys decide was how you could describe this definition? We I feel like we had a tricky time trying to make it clearer than the first sentence because we feel like I want to see if we establish a pretty good basis for the definition, but we had some questions. Okay. Um, what does significant mean? Where it says significant impact to clean air, water, and land. Oh, it mentions food access and we weren't sure like Clean air, water, and land, how that really fits in. What else? Oh, and noise. Mm -hmm. You were saying, where does noise fall into clean air, water, and land? Mm -hmm. Kind of air, because it's like kind of air pollution. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I feel like the first sentence is pretty good. And there's some, a lot of examples. Would you read it again, just to yes. remind us? Environmental burdens means any significant impact to clean air, water, and land, including any destruction, damage, or impairment of natural resources resulting from intentional or for reasonably foreseeable causes. And then there's a sentence at the end. Yeah. Well, it's not really for us. <laughs> it says like, et cetera, or other activities that contaminate or alter the quality of the environment and pose a risk to public health. So then we thought it's important to bring public health maybe up to the first sentence too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and even even that first, I mean, how do folks feel like, do you feel like that first sentence is like, I get it, or are you still kind of like, huh? Like, I mean, you had questions about it, right? Um, what do we think? Anyway, this, this will work before you, and that's great. I mean, I think just seeing, feeling, touching these things is the goal today, so. Okay, number three, are you number three? Yeah. Right okay, would you read so the definition? Oh, it's very long. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we break down in like one, two, three, four, five, uh, six subheadings. Like yeah. Key terms. yeah. And first is like uh, environmental justice. In short, our group decides, decided that it is for all Vermonters wherever they are living in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is like environmental justice, but it has like environmental benefits. And we broke down like what by environmental benefits are, I think, uh, those guys who covered, we have like list of similar things over here. So if you okay. want, we can go through again. Otherwise, we can leave it. Okay. Uh, okay. So we wrote like environmental benefits uh, that environmental justice would be if every Vermonter uh, would have access to clean uh, drinking water, clean air, open green spaces, healthy homes without any moles, pets, uh, 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 metallic pollution or anything, access to food, solar panel, and uh, all other resources, be in, uh, like solar panel and everything 
they should be having like those are like environmental benefits which every Vermonter have. And the second one uh, sub category is environmental burdens that uh, and we actually uh, thought that environmental burden technically that that is like something which you shared, but we thought that environmental burden is uh, somewhat related to uh, uh, to uh, income mm -hmm. or uh, income level uh, because uh, environmental burden is different. Uh, with a uh, different income level of every individual wherever they are living. Some are living in good areas, so environmental burden in case of flooding or air pollution or contamination of land, desertification or anything that wouldn't be the same as uh, with the uh, people living uh, in low income areas. So they have like uh, living near the industrial areas or everything. So that is like environmental burden for them. So that's how we define it. And they have like uh, lack of access to environmental resources overall and environmental resources like environmental benefits we just listed. And the third one is like decision making sub sub components decision making that every person uh, should be having uh, uh, say in decision making uh, for every policy uh, related to be it environment or in general for the benefit of the uh, people of Vermont. So every person should have a say in it. And uh, we discussed that uh, there is need of interpretation of laws because uh, in in the constitution while driving here i read that i don't remember the exact figure but there's like figure that uh, this person people uh, uh doesn't have like 14 year or more than 14 year who can speak english in their homes so there are like seven percent people living here who have like other languages and other cultures and they have barrier to understand those laws and regulations and if they don't have interpretation of those and those are in english how would they have a say in decision making or you know giving their input mm -hmm. and uh, uh another one is that uh, environmental justice uh, recognizes the uh, needs and redressal of grievances sort of of all the communities living in vermont uh, that's how we just redefined it and then resource management is another like key term uh, in, in this and that is like sharing resources uh, with the one that are being impacted due to environmental burdens mm -hmm. so that is like there there should be resource allocation and there would be under this law as it says and then uh, needs of all the Vermonter was uh, another sub component wherever they are living their, their environmental needs should be met and that's what the environmental justice is. If I'm missing any, anything other group members can. You said. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, that's a lot. I like, uh, would you read that one sentence for all Vermonters? Every, I don't know, I just like the way you put it. Environmental okay. justice. Yeah, environmental justice uh, is the uh, justice for all the Vermonters wherever they are. So wherever is like big, big yeah. thing. I mean, they are in different parts so of Vermont, like, some in good areas, some in bad areas, some with more environmental burden, some with less. Yeah, that's great. Yes, thank you, thank you. You did have a very big. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, are you are you you all are next? I think. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Would you be willing to read it? Okay, we had four and five. So four. Environmental justice focused populations means any census block group in which a the annual median household income is not more than 80% of the state median household income. B, persons of color and indig indigenous peoples comprise at least 6% or more of the population. Or C, at least 1% or more of households have limited English proficiency. And then five defines limited English proficiency, uh, means that a household does not have a, num a member 14 years or older who speaks English very well, which we just referenced, um, as defined by the US Census Bureau. Okay. The meat. <laughs> oh, we got a little stuck in the data of it all and not being able to see, I did anyway, not being able to see what those things actually mean. But yeah, bottom is the starting point. Yeah. So no, I can't say that. So they intend to identify those most impacted by environmental justice issues. So there's specific ways of doing that that we were not terribly sure. Uh, the on the short end of the stick. <laughs> there you go. Although in this case, the definition is also it's little geographic areas arbitrarily defined by the U.S. Census Bureau. How do they, as a group of people, get impacted? Ah, yeah. So it's not a person level measurement. It is a geographic measurement that's saying in this area of Vermont, is there either 
uh, a median income of we think fifty four thousand or less, eighty percent of whatever that measure, the, whatever that is. Let's say fifty four thousand. Same language. Or and or six percent of the population or more are BIPOC, and or uh which percent was it for right a certain percent is limited English, or there's limited English proficiency. so if that group that area on average meets any of those three marks they would be considered so everybody in that area part of an environmental justice focus we talked about who might get missed or what we might miss in that type of yeah, yeah. so we went on a tangent <laughs> i think it's important yeah, it's important it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you um Stephanie, I, uh, sorry. I just want to say that the census block is a real thing because they only count 5,000 or more people. Should a lot of Vermont towns have less than 5,000? Most. Is it the census block group? I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like around 2,000. Yeah, it's the census block. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, like, it's, it's, it's hard still, to use census yeah. data in small still, states. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. What's the best, what's the local list, best done? Yes, that's what we were talking about. about. <laughs> good, good. Well, that's the work before you, so that now you're kind of, you're, you're picking it up, right? Um, so now, can we go to the folks on Teams? Would you be, would somebody be willing to read uh, the definition that you were looking at and what it means? Tell us what it means. Sure. The definition we're looking at is uh, meaningful participation. So meaningful participation means that all individuals have the opportunity to participate in energy, climate change, and environmental decision making. Examples include needs assessments, planning, implementation, permitting, compliance, and enforcement, and evaluation. Meaningful participation also integrates diverse knowledge systems, histories, traditions, languages, and cultures of indigenous communities and decision-making processes. It requires that communities are enabled and administratively assisted to participate fully through education and training. Meaningful participation requires the state to operate in a transparent manner with regard to opportunities for community input and also encourages the development of environmental, energy, and climate change stewardship. Yeah. What did, what did you guys decide that that means? What's it mean? <laughs> Uh, so for us, we we said meaningful participation means everyone receives a fair opportunity to be included in a transparent decision making process in a way that honors and respects their time, expertise, both lived and professional and access to resources. That's good. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm just a facilitator. But I don't, I don't. Uh, thank you. Let's let's make sure to capture that. I know we're we're taking minutes and we're you know we're recording this meeting, but I think uh, that's a nice concise way of putting it. Anything else you guys want to offer in your conversation from your conversation? Uh, not really. I think yeah, just more in general. We just have discussions around like our our process and and how we would um, how we landed on that definition. And, and the different ways that you can go when you're starting to think um, there is a, a conversation about using like metaphors or analogies even um, as a way to to explain the definition. Yeah. Um, well, thank you all for engaging in this activity. And the point really is to make you aware of the fact that these defin definitions are an important part for you to be paying attention to as you embark on your work. And um, not to make you feel overwhelmed, but to say that you got to get to a place where everybody here understands what you're talking about before you can have any hope of changing changing the world that you're being asked to change, right? Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to, I know we're at break time, so I'm going to ask uh, us to just take five more minutes before you're going to get a break, and then you will get a break, I promise. And I would like to invite uh, uh, Caitlin Ellerman, and she's going to go over some of the, we're getting into the, to the um, how, like how you're going to do this. We're going to start talking about your overall responsibilities, the tasks and timelines in Act 154. Um, and before we break into two groups, which we're going to do after the break, um, Caitlin's going to just go over the basics of being good public participants in this process and, and in just five minutes and then we'll and then before we break i'll talk a little more go ahead sounds good Thank yeah you. i'm sorry to delay the break <laughs> a few more minutes 
Um, so this, I think this portion is largely geared toward the advisory council members who um, are coming in um, more as community representatives, not necessarily um, currently um, public servants, um, whereas um, the interagency committee is, is staffed by um, public employees, so um, they might be um, more, more familiar with these backgrounds. So uh, in the materials for the meeting, you will have seen an onboarding document, the Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and that runs through uh, most of the key items um, for kind of getting situated uh, as a member. Um, and so a few of those key pieces that we wanted to um, call your attention to and make sure you had a chance to, um, to review are um, state partner email account, state code of ethics, Public Records Act and open meeting law. So there are instructions for getting set up with a partner email account. Um, it is strongly recommended, if not required. Um, it will facilitate um, participation greatly and sort of fulfilling the public records requirements in particular and just really um, organizing your work on the council. Um, so that there's, it's fairly simple. Um, our agency of digital services will support you in getting this email account. Um, and that will be sort of the home for all the documents, um, that are going to be exchanged, um, through this work. Um, so you'll see that information. Go ahead. So, um, I, so I'm Maggie Jenner and I work at the agency of natural resources, the partner email accounts. I know there's some resistance for folks to set up a partner email account, but it will really help you organize the information of this working group versus all your other personal information. And we're happy to send emails to both the partner account and your personal email, um, but it's it will help you tremendously if you get a uh, information request to be able to just find the information quickly and not have uh, the state have access to all your other personal information. So. It's a really, it protects you. And so I really highly recommend that um, you go through with the ADS process and we're here to help you at the agency. If you get hung up or you're having issues, feel free to reach out to Carla and I, and we'll help you with that, so. Which we are likely to receive on um, requests for information based on experience with the climate action um, work. So it's, it's really highly encouraged to set up those. And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that kind of overlap of public records and, and email as well. Um, I see a hand for Walter. Well, I just wanted to, I, I, I think I know the answer, but I just wanted to confirm. So I, you know, by getting a partner email account, will that, and you could, if that's the way we would prefer to do this work, separate from our other types of work, um, that would include, I guess, getting set up um, being able to use that partner email account to be set up for teams so that that's yes. separate. Or yes. Okay. That's what I want to make sure. All right. And yeah, that I'm should, sorry. that should work well. And I'm sorry, did you mention who we should reach out to, 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 to get set up with that partner email account? I, you mentioned an office, but I didn't get a name or who, what. Yeah, so it's the Agency of Digital Services Help Desk. Um, the phone number we have is 802-498-7873. Um, and that's in the onboarding document. As Maggie mentioned, Maggie or Carla can also answer any questions if, it, yeah. if you get hung up. Let me give you a Oh, the partner email account should be different from uh, uh, the state email. That's a really good question. So the interagency committee members would be using their state email. Okay. Yeah. If you have a state email address, that's fine. Vermont.gov. Yeah. Okay. If you have a Vermont.gov, that that's interchangeable with a partner email. Okay.
So I'm just going in order of the, the onboarding document here real quick. Uh, no, we'll have to public records just because we've already mentioned it and we've tied in. So Public Records Act, I um, feel like I'm getting low on time with five minutes. Um, the Advisory Council is a public body subject to Public Records Act. Basically anything that you write down is a public record. Anything that you type in your computer related to the work on the Advisory Council is a public record and would be res potentially responsive to a public records request. So those need to be treated as such um, and, and hence why it's a lot easier to have all your documents in your partner email as opposed to your personal email because then you'll need to be digging through there. Um, there are a, there are links in this onboarding document for the Public Records Act. There's about a 20 minute presentation by the Attorney General's office um, to the Climate Council. Um, so please watch that if you haven't already. Um, it gives a really good overview. There's a Q&A after, so it's like a total of 30 minutes there. Um, again, we're happy to answer questions once you've digested the um, the onboarding document and the uh, trainings. Um, open meeting law, uh, here we are. <laughs> um, we again have kind of key points in the onboarding document. There's also another video by the Attorney General's office that's about 15 minutes long. Um, that, one's, that one's short and sweet, um, giving the overview. Key um, and, and the Agency of Natural Resources sort of facilitating this is Posting, you know, having an agenda, posting it online um, in advance of the meeting, making your meetings open to the public, um, able to join here in person or online, um, and having an opportunity to participate. Hence the public comment opportunity and um, taking minutes. Uh, that those are sort of the high um, key points. And then I think uh, lastly, in sort of the legal realm, is the uh, ethics state ethics code um, was uh, adopted last year, and that does include a training. Um, so there's a link uh, in the onboarding document um, to take the training. And you know, key key points is really not misusing this position as a a, a public servant um, that you know on this council. Um, for, for any kind of benefit um, and being mindful and avoiding conflicts or appearances of conflicts of interest. Um, and then finally, you'll see in that document information about um, per diem and expenses, uh, acknowledging that it is not at all adequate, um, but it is something and there are um, some FAQs uh, to help support you in, in that piece. And I, there was a uh, quick, error in the um in the attachment where it talked about online meetings only we're back into doing person so the per diem does um the per diem is back essentially it was during online meetings they had kind of uh, they had like altered the anyway you had pointed out to me caitlin that there was an error in the document about online oh, meetings versus, yeah. can you just oh sure so the we um we we're leaning heavily on the climate council setup um, and sort of background material. So there's there's a note in the FAQ that refers to meetings being online. Um, the climate council actually has not had anything but an online meeting yet. I think their first one is next week in person. Um, so that's just an error, a carryover error in terms of um, meeting meeting online. And then Carla wanted to point out text messages. Subject to Public Records Act. Um, so to the extent you're putting something into your phone, um, that's that's also you have to be um, aware that you're going to have to pull from that. So again, using the partner email makes it really straightforward. Oh, no, no question. Uh, just so refreshing my mind. A uh, state employee don't receive a uh, uh, right? Right. Okay, any any questions for Caitlin before we give you a break? Great, thank you. And like Caitlin said, there's people available to answer questions as you move forward. So what we're going to do after a break, you're going to get 10 minutes now. You'll get 10 minutes online. Um, <clears throat> teams, folks, we're going to do breakout sessions. We're going to break up into the interagency committee and the advisory council for a while to start thinking about how you're going to approach this work. OK, um, interagency folks, after the break, you're going to be in here with Laura. 
Um, advisory council folks, you get to come with me. I'm gonna meet you in the room right through on the other side of the kitchen, okay? Um, and folks on teams that are on the advisory council, you'll come with me, you'll be on my laptop, but maybe it won't be as nice a setup, but we'll at least, uh, you'll be able to see, hear us and participate. Same with uh, any agency folks I'll, uh, will be here on Laura's laptop, okay? So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Uh, Please try to be prompt so we can get you out of here on time. Okay. What time do we come back? Uh, so it is two twenty-five, two thirty-five. Okay. Okay. Who's in the video? Oh. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that exercise. Yes. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Just like when I left, it's like when I left, it's like when I left, it's like when I left. Probably. Uh, uh, I'm just was making sure that I didn't need to grab. I think I need some markers. Over by your door. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's just it's like, what do we need to talk about? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm the minute taker. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anyone who's virtually. No, we have one couple of Okay, great. And I'm hoping to hear from Susan. Okay. Let us know if you can't hear us. Or if you can't but otherwise, you're going to get started. But really, we have the next 40 minutes together. John is joining you. Okay. We're going to break it out into sort of three, three big chunks. So the first is reviewing the major issues, context, recent history, lessons learned. And just from other efforts within this realm to so kind of get that on the table. The second part will be brainstorming potential actions to address um, and to move forward sort of as, as a committee. And then we'll get to prioritization of those action steps of which, which things should occur first. Um, so I'm not monitoring. Susanna, can you hear us? Okay. All right. Oh, nice job. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm the last person who needs a microphone in front of so loud. <laughs> Great, so let's start diving with any major issues, context that this group wants to put out on the table. So this is the interagency um, of our committee. So these are agencies where we're all at different points of where we're in doing our own work on equity or environmental justice. Um, and I and I've seen a lot of really good work happening. I'm just curious if people based on their agency could talk about either what you you know some agencies have equity indexes out there, some agencies have done their own language access plan. I'm just curious if folks could give us kind of like a context setting of where you're at. And you might be in the very beginning. I think it's really important for us to understand that we're all in very different places when it comes to this work. And so having an understanding of what your agency is committed to or where you're trying to get and what and without criticism, it's just we're all yeah. in very different spots. So I'm happy to go first for the NRB. Okay, we had Carla and the team in in September. In September, um, I would say that our staff was a little surprised. Surprise may not be the right word, but I don't think they had thought about it. 
and um, we are putting together an internal team that will start to look at what we need to do. Um, but I don't, I, I think that it has, well, there's going to be tr new triggers, new jurisdictional things that we'll need to consider. And I always use the example of a if a grocery store wants an Act 250 permit, we're going to have to look at it through the lens of if it helps these populations, these, these folks, where that didn't used to be something that got considered. Um, and then also the language, all the language access and um, accessibility and outreach. Outreach is going to be huge for us because we, we post all of our public stuff in newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all know that nobody reads newspapers anymore, and it's going to be it's going to be a low it's going to be a learning curve for, for people, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I'm trying, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's yeah. his problem. I started to... <laughs> 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 it's, like, it's going to be a real learning curve. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a <laughs> After that meeting, they went, why does, why, after that meeting, they just came in, they went, why does this affect us and what, what is going to change? I, and I just, I just looked at them and I said, it will become more clear after our first meeting. I just let it go for that. But yeah, I mean, it's got big ramifications, I think, for the work we do. Yeah, we don't have the doling out funds and about the equity that way, but we have all the um, I was just kind of brainstorming this morning. You know, with a page on the note on the notepad of different ways that we've got to be considering it. Yeah. Um, and then started to be a little more nervous as I started going through the legislation, looking at the deadlines and what we yeah. can do with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But looking forward to hearing what everybody else is yeah. doing so we can take some yeah. of that. And yes, absolutely. That. Go next. Um, I'm in. The commissioner said here, so I'm going to talk about APC, but also my lens as an environmental officer. So we put out about yeah, sorry, I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. environmental officer at APC. Um, we distribute about $2 million a year in community development funds, and those have to benefit low and moderate income populations in Vermont. So that's up to 8% of area immediate income. So, you know, kind of from that lens, we are already sort of looking at, you know, uh, low income populations and vulnerable populations. We also help make town halls more accessible for senior and vulnerable populations. So from that lens, we kind of, you know, look at it in our work, but also um, we have programs for recovery housing for individuals uh, experiencing homelessness or substance abuse. So, I've learned a lot in my first year about you know, all the vulnerable populations in Vermont, kind of factors deep threats to justice populations. Um, but a big thing we've been thinking about lately is where are we focusing our funding? Is it all going to Chittenden County? Kind of. Not really, but a lot of it is because that's where all the big housing projects are. And how do we think about where we put our funding? What categories we are focusing on? What communities? What communities need our funding? What might need help to apply? So all of those kinds of things. A lot of, yeah, I didn't really like make sense there, but there's no, a lot of did. context, I guess. Um, yeah. Oh, and we're also thinking about how to get the word out about our program to people who might have limited English proficiency. Um, I'm not working on that directly, but we are working on some kind of language app or something. For our consolidated plan, which is our annual, here's how we're going to spend our money. Because we want input from a, from Vermont on where we should be spending money, where we should be focusing housing. This is very deep. Carla uh, from the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, Grace, this is very interesting because in our group with the definitions, um, uh, to identify the, the those communities. Um, within the bill, we were actually talking about how those would help in prioritizing funding. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely going to be part of this conversation. Yeah, just 
add one more thing. Like, there's all this housing money. Some of it's going to private organizations. A lot of it is going to the government. And there's a lot more federal funding. Like, not just related housing, but ARPA and COVID yeah. and stuff. So, like, this is a we're so excited. It's a really big opportunity to actually, like, hey, how about spending? Let's take a step back and make sure it's the most Yes. I'll, I'll follow that as a, someone who's gaining out a lot of money. Um, so I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the State Housing Mitigation Officer at Vermont Emergency Management. So representing Vermont Emergency Management here um, and managing a program where we're handing out a significant amount of funding, mostly to do flood reduction work in the state. And I think the when I think about this, the, the trick is it, it's easy enough to say on our scoring criteria for a grant, let's add a line that says, does this impact low income populations? Does this impact certain people? Um, and where I get stuck is that that's, that's not even almost enough because it takes so much hand holding and, and effort on our part in the outreach and engagement that we do to bring people in to even get them to the point of applying for a grant, especially if it's a FEMA grant, because a lot of our towns are like FEMA. Uh, for good reason. And so, and now we have our own state funding that's a lot more flexible. We can create a lot, we can create our own in that space and within the confines. But I think for me, it's the, the process of figuring out how do we prioritize who we're going to to provide support so that they can get in the door to do applications. Because it has to be on that front end. I can't just, the, oh, they checked the box. And are also pushing out a lot of funding through the ARPA. Um, we have, um, I think we have about 150 million dollars. The, the process to get the money to the people who need it the most it takes an incredible amount of hand holding. And that, when I say hand holding, it's like actually filling out applications for okay. people and accessing people who have who are illiterate and that's accessing low income Vermonters or even elderly Vermonters who don't have telephones and they rely on their neighbors. It's we've added probably 10 staff to one program just to do that one on one outreach. So I just plus one that because it's it's that's the part of where I that's the part of where this EJ bill I think for us as agencies who also work at the state house we need to understand what resources going to take ongoing and continue to tell appropriators like you don't get to give us one time funding and walk away and say you did your job like this is an ongoing resource absolutely um to add on to what maggie just mentioned i think what's going to be really interesting from uh the engagement between the agencies here is that i hope that we're going to be able to share with each other stories of success and programs that have been really helpful in advancing environmental justice. And so the program that Maggie spoke to is one of those examples, um, relatively new in inception, but extremely successful at um, advancing environmental justice and delivering those services that Maggie just um, spoke 